$34,000 per year on each person in prison. Again, $34,000 a year. We spend less than half of that per student in K through 12 education. That's an example of just totally wrong priorities. It's like, why are we putting more priorities on locking people up for nonviolent drug offenses than we are giving our kids a good chance of education. It just doesn't make sense. So the solution is to reprioritize where we're spending our money, where we're spending our time and our energy, and putting all of that where it matters. And that $34,000 we are spending to lock someone up for a year is just really the start of the cost of that because they're not working, they're not paying income tax, they're likely absentee parents to their kids who might need more services at school as a result of being orphaned. Absolutely. Uh, so, and, and as you were talking, I was thinking about, and maybe we can talk a little bit about this too, uh, student debt. And, um, you know, that amount of money, we could, edu you know, we could give people a year of college sure. for less than a year of jail. Sure. And actually, the, like, just like the, how we're like, throwing money away um, in our healthcare system, we are also doing the same thing in our education system. We're spending more money, at least on the federal level, um, you know, with, with programs going to uh, you know, administrative costs and things like that. Essentially, the federal government is spending more money than it needs to right now to give every single person that's currently in a public university in the country uh, four years of free tuition. So it's not about there not being enough money out there. It's just about spending the money efficiently and reprioritizing where we're going to spend that money. So I think that honestly we need to figure out a way to forgive all student debt because it's a, it's a priority for us as a country to, to not have people going into bankruptcy and to have people being productive members of our workforce. But then also to make sure that you know for everybody that does want to go to college, they can go to college. And I think that there's a hundred percent a way to do that that would actually end up saving us money in so many ways as a nation. And I, I'm thinking that even on a statewide level, UConn, the, the tuition goes up every year and it was sort of scandalous recently that the foundation paid Hillary Clinton something like a quarter of a million dollars for a speaking event and you just wonder if that money could have gone towards some better end. Sure. Um, now, you, you spend a lot of time in a classroom, too. Now, have you felt the, um, the firsthand the experience of, you know, the Common Core testing and the kind of teacher accountability that is kind of new? Um, have you? felt its influence on, on how your classrooms work or what you see in the schools that you go into? Sure. So first of all, let me be very clear. As a substitute teacher, my, my job right. is way different than a, an actual right. teacher. Um, but I was a teacher. One of my first jobs that I had was as an elementary school teacher, both here in New London and then at Middletown at St. Mary's here and uh, St. Sebastian's in Middletown. But that was you know about 10 years ago before Common Core was obviously implemented. Um, so although I don't, I don't know firsthand what it's like because I'm not the person, yeah. you know, kind of behind the scenes in the classroom there, um, I do have a lot of friends that are teachers, uh, and I also have a lot of family members that are teachers. In fact, almost my entire family comes from an education background or, or works in education or did before they retired. Um, so I don't know anybody personally that is a fan of Common Core. Some people are fans of parts of it, and some people just think that the whole thing is a bad idea, kind of like the whole no child left behind. It's just this idea of like, let's just keep implementing new things, which really, who do they benefit? The corporations that are pushing for them. So Common Core, all of a sudden we have all of these new textbooks and 100% we're replacing all our textbooks with Common Core textbooks, which is making some companies ridiculous amounts of money because they're the ones selling those textbooks to our schools. But that's just a small example. The point is that education, I, on one hand, and this came up in our last debate, it's fundamental to like being a successful person just in general. Like we 100% need to support education. There's no question about that whatsoever. The way that we do that, I think, is in question or should be in question because 
it, the way that we, we Compulsory schooling just doesn't work for so many people. When we have 25% of the young people that, that, that start high school, drop out, that's a national crisis. But we're not really doing anything about that. We need to figure out schooling that works for everybody. And that doesn't, and, and uh, standardized testing is not the answer in any way, shape, or form. We can have like common core, like, like little c, little, like little c, little c, like a common core of things that people, like milestones should be making, but standardized tests should absolutely not be the way to measure that. So I think that this doesn't have like an absolute easy answer or a sound bite. I think what we need is a team of people that doesn't include in any way, shape, or form anybody that has any tie to industry. We need educators and parents and students working together to figure out solutions that make schools that work for everybody or all young people. Now, I'm going to move a little from the statewide issues and I really don't know what the issues are in your district that need representation in Hartford, but maybe you can talk a little bit about how you feel you could bring back to, to your district sure. a, as a state senator. Sure. I think that, that the issues across Connecticut are pretty similar, and I think that it's broken down largely between urban areas and then other areas, both rural and suburban. I think our urban areas in Connecticut, Bridgeport, New London, Waterbury, Hartford, uh, you know, Stanford even to a little bit degree. Our urban areas are the areas that are suffering the most. And I think that as a state, we need to make sure that the urban areas, you know, which are for the most part, you know, we're talking about folks of color. You know, that's where Connecticut is a pretty racially diverse state, but most of our, our racial diversity comes from those cities. And those young kids of color that are going to school in, in, in those places, in those urban areas, are the ones that aren't getting, you know, as much uh, attention as the folks in our suburban areas. You know, when we come out with like, you know, these national rankings, U.S. News and World Report or, or Newsweek will come out and be like, oh, the best schools in the country. You know, sometimes the schools in my district, the 33rd, in fact, they just released them, will be in that. And, and that's, it's great for those schools, but it, unless all of our young people are achieving at a very similar level or like an equitable level, it doesn't quite matter because all of us need to succeed. So in my district, I think uh, what comes up a lot, um, especially, uh, you know, not so much by the folks that I'm talking to, the constituents or the voters that I'm talking to, but comes up a lot in the debates um, is property taxes. And I think everybody recognizes that property taxes are, are too right. high in Connecticut. But honestly, that doesn't come up so much when I'm talking to people um, on the campaign trail, if you will. What comes up, honestly, more than anything is a lack of faith in our government. It comes up in every conversation. Nobody, except for the people that are at the debates wearing the Democratic or the, the Republican, the corporate controlled parties pins, literally not a single person I've talked to has not brought that up. Nobody has faith in our government. Everybody I've talked to is, thinks that to some degree or another, our government has sold us out. And some people are, they, they, they're so fed up that they don't even want to vote because they know that their vote right. is meaningless or they think that their vote is meaningless because as long as they're voting for this, the status quo, this essentially one party system, because you have two parties controlled by the same corporation, which makes it a one party system, that their vote's not going to matter. At least that they believe that. In a lot of ways, that's true. Luckily, in the 33rd district, there are choices. You have, uh, you know, an independent candidate that that is, well, independent of those the corporations right. that are controlling the other two th parties. So the point is that property taxes are high and everybody's going to agree with that. But what's on the, the mind of most people, I think, as a representative, all the people I talk to, is the fact that nobody has faith in our government. We've been sold out and everybody recognizes that. So it's sort of like what you were saying that... Uh people wouldn't mind spending the money if they felt that it was going to a good cause. I mean, the folks that can afford it, and a lot of folks in my district, it, like there are a lot of folks that are struggling, but my, my district, which is like a big chunk of Middlesex County, are doing relatively well. Even though we don't have very much industry at all, we have like a few small factories and manufacturing centers. Um, in general, uh, you know, we have folks that are commuting to other areas of the state, uh, you know, for, for a lot of, in a lot of cases. So Middlesex County in the lower Connecticut River Valley, the 33rd district is doing much better than a lot of other places, but there's still a lot of people struggling. And then furthermore, there's a lot of people that just can't afford to live there to begin with, you know, like even 
you know, people like that in my generation or people I graduated with, like, oh, it's beautiful here. We have the Connecticut River. We have all of these wonderful places to visit. And like, just people, other people come, you know, it's a tourist right. area. But a lot of folks can't live there. So we also need, you know, we need jobs. We need to lower our property taxes and we need to create, um, you know, incentives for people to come here. Now, um, this year, um, you actually were endorsed by the Norwich Bulletin. And um, do you feel as though things are coming together this year more than some of the times you've, you've run in the past? Uh, yeah, absolutely, in a lot of ways. Um, like I said, I spent a few years down in, uh, in Virginia working, coming back and forth. So while I was down there, for the most part, I wasn't as connected to the district as I wanted to be. But since being back, um, I felt I felt sucked in. Uh, once I started working in the school district and spending time and like starting to volunteer here, like in the 33rd district, especially in like other parts besides just Westbrook, um, I feel like more like a, a the, more part of the community than I ever bef I ha ever have before. Um, so I, I thought about it. it's like oh I'm going to come back to Connecticut, uh, you know, after leaving Virginia, and then you know, kind of hang out figure out my options and then probably go to New Haven or go up to like Litchfield County where I'm originally from when I was born or just somewhere else, you know, because there's all these things. But I just, I feel a strong sense of place here. Like Connecticut is my home and I love it. But now like the more time I spend in, in, in this area, the more time I feel like I need to spend and the more time I need to feel like I'm fighting for it. And I think people recognize that. Having run a bunch of times before, I have a lot of name recognition. I'm doing a good job with the social media game. I'm doing a good job, you know, when I'm talking to people, um, including like the editorial board of the Norwich Bulletin. They recognize that I'm in this for the long haul. It's not something that I'm, I'm taking lightly, I'm taking it seriously, and that I'm going to do a good job because I'm representing the best interests of the people. Now, we have about five minutes left, and I thought maybe I'd ask you to let people know what kind of help your campaign could use you know, this last week as you want to get the message out and how people can learn more about it. Sure. I think... Um, one of the big things, because I didn't really come up, even though my opponents are spending a ton of money, I'm not spending a lot of money. Um, so we don't have a campaign headquarters. I don't have a lot of campaign materials, because again, I think it's antithetical to democracy to have to spend a lot of money to get elected. Um, I think one of the big things that if anybody's into it, if like, if folks are listening and, and y'all like what I say, uh, you know, letters to the editor, and especially for, uh, you know, daily papers that still have time to, um, to print them, that would be really helpful. Um, you know, supporting the Bennett for Senate State uh, Facebook page, and then getting folks, um, you know, getting friends and acquaintances to like it. It's really simple. Facebook.com Bennett.for.Senate. Um, using the hashtag actually Bennett <laughs> for Senate uh, for F O R Bennett F O R Senate. Um, there's a couple of other folks with the last name Bennett running for Senate uh, or State Senate in different places. Um, but I'm really trying to make that like you're the only one in Connecticut. Definitely. Though the only one in Connecticut uh, yeah it just it literally um, because I think social media is such an important part of our society at this point uh, in 2014 that that it can be a really powerful tool and not having the money that these other corporate uh, candidates have that that's a really big push that I'm making you know going out and talking to people is something that I do and if anybody has friends or neighbors or or family members that live in the district to make the phone call or to go over and things like that but like that's awesome uh, you know the letters to the editor are awesome and then just using the social media to help promote like what I stand for because really like it's I don't I don't think this is about me per se. Hopefully what I'm really trying to do is represent the people. Like, because I don't feel that. If I saw a great candidate that was doing what I'm doing, then I wouldn't feel the need to run. But I have never seen that in my life. Like, I actually, one of my, my, my challengers, or not challengers, one of my, um, the person that I'm running against, Emily Bjornberg, I actually really like Emily, and I think she's a great person. We actually agree on a lot. However, I don't think that she's going to do as good a job as I am, first of all. Second of all, she is tied to a party that has sold our country out. And that's the big thing. You know, in 2012, when uh, Melissa Schlag wanted to run for the Green Party, 
uh, in our district, that was great because I thought that she would do a right. good job, and she did do a great job. This, this year, that didn't happen. So this isn't about me. It's about the, the voters of Connecticut and about the 33rd district. Like, I'm not going to fix anything by myself. I'm only going to do it with the help of other people. And in the last minute, I would like to show people the ballot. This is uh, one of the Westbrook ballots. So there, there are two uh, state rep candidates um, change a lot, but uh, you can point out your name because I can. And there are quite a few green candidates. It isn't just one lone green. Um, so we do have a little bit of a slate this year, even though it's not statewide. Um, well, thank you, Ben, Colin, and um, good luck. Thank you. Uh, if people are willing to stand at the polls on election oh, yeah, day or absolutely. whatever, they can get in touch with you. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to give my number if I have time. Sure. Uh, it's 860-395-8392, uh, and that's my personal cell phone number, and please feel free to call me at any time. Otherwise, it's Colin Bennett for Senate at gmail.com also works. Um, either way, yeah, just reach out. It would be great to have people at the polls holding signs, things like that. Um, yeah. I okay, well, it. thanks very much. Um, we probably won't have a live show next week because we'll be out at some poll holding a sign. In two weeks, Le Luther Weeks from Connecticut Voters Count will be on the show and he'll be talking about how the election went and the upcoming audit. So thank you, Colin, thank and you. Uh, good pleasure. luck. And see you all in a couple of weeks. When I sit in contemplation of the human situation I often feel a certain sense of pride Our achievements are many and mighty And the evidence cannot be denied But my reverie is shaken for my thoughts are often taken To a tragedy that happened long ago when they roam through this land, beings awesome and grand, the fabulous dinosaurs. They were creatures of a manner quite reptilian in their unique and stylish way. And their numbers could be counted in the millions, though there's zero of these heroes in the world today. They had music, art, and fashion. They had dinosauric passion. And I think they'd be enraged and mortified that when they're mentioned today, it's only to say their brains were small and they died. Their brains were small.